basically what cinema is. So, so cinema has an inherent relationship with society. Cinema emerges from society. So cinema is a reflection of where society is at a particular point in time. Now, the most common is the cinema influence society or the society influence cinema. And my answer to that always is that that's why there's this beautiful word called symbiotic. It has a symbiotic relationship, society and cinema. Cinema is the exaggerated version of society and society can often be the exaggerated version of cinema also. For example, when once there was a film called Sivapur Rojakar, uh, which was one of the earliest uh, films in India on psychopathic and dark cinema with Kamala Hassan. Many uh, young people tried to behave like him and ended up killing people. So uh, they were influenced and then it became a huge topic of discussion. And you know, people began to ask that question again. Should films be made in a certain way because it influences society in a certain way? And the response to that is that it works both ways. You know? So on the one hand, cinema is a creative um, endeavor. But on the other hand, it also has an element of social responsibility. But social responsibility and creativity also have a symbiotic they influence each other, you know. Sometimes some of the best films can be the craziest films. That can also happen. In fact, a lot of postmodern cinema and abstract cinema comes from a certain sense of creative madness. And so it's thrown open to interpretation. You know, a lot of the postmodern cinema that we see that we saw coming out of Europe, for example, in the 1980s, the 1990s, you know. Were, were very abstract, very dark, and uh, they were like paintings, you know, you could interpret them whichever way you want. If somebody moved, and the camera moved with them, you could interpret that movement, I'm just moving my hand. Let's assume the camera is moving with my hand. You could interpret it any way you want. You could say it's moving with stress, it's moving with anticipation, it's moving with sadness, it's moving with suspense, it could be anything. So, so cinema is both creative and social and cultural and political. So what is it that drives cinema? Through time immemorial, over the last hundred odd years that cinema has existed, what is it that drives cinema? The one thing that drives cinema, broadly speaking, is the content. Many, many people would ask, so what is that film about? They will not ask, the first question will not be what camera was used. The first question will not be how was it edited. The first question will be what is the film about? So content becomes important. Now where does content come from? Content comes from here, right? And also here, sometimes the heart and the mind, often the soul. Where do they get their content from? They get their content from life, life itself. And from life, what do you do when you live life? You experience it. And when you experience life, there are certain ideas that get formed in your head. It could be anything. I mean, you could be walking the road. You could take a bus. When you get into the bus, and you think about, what if I want to make a film on this experience? Because you see, crowds in a bus and you look at how every morning a person, you could make a film on that, a short film, how every morning you take a bus, you wait through the crowds. One day somebody pokes you in the rib and you have a fight. The second day maybe a girl gets eat teased and you save her. So there are five different things that can happen on a bus journey on five different days and that could turn into an idea that you want to make a film on a bus journey, or the, or the experience of traveling in a bus on a routine basis. And from that idea, you develop what is known as a narrative, the script of your bus journey. You know, what happened on day one, what happened on day two. Maybe you met the same eight teasers on five different days, and on the fifth day, you actually bash them for what you did, or something, you know, something like that. And so you develop a narrative. 
And the narrative usually has a graph. It has a beginning, it has a middle, it has an end. It has to have that because it has to go forward. It can't go, go, can't go backward, you know. So, but that narrative could be linear, it could be non-linear, it could be uh, literal, it could be metaphorical, it could be abstract, it could be again postmodern, uh, it could be silent, such as Charlie Chaplin, you know. So, I mean, if you look at Charlie Chaplin, for example, one of the most common questions about him is, would he have been as great and as successful if he had been born and made films during the talkies. Because all of his films were really during the silent era. And the kind of body language that he developed, and the kind of narrative that he developed, the kind of visuals that he developed, were pretty much in tune with the silent era in cinema. And the other thing about Charlie Chaplin is that when we talk about content, he developed one of the greatest films called The Great Dictator as a critique on Hitler at a time when Hitler was at his peak. So he could have got bumped off by, by Hitler doing that. But he still went ahead and made a political commentary on Hitler. So, so I think the, and we still remember him for that film The Great Dictator. You know? Similarly, in India you have films like Ankur, Mandhan, Pathar Panchali, anyone wants to name any films? So, so you remember these films even today, not because of the, of the technology, not because of anything else, but because of the content of those films, yeah? So from the narrative, what do you develop? You develop a script, you develop a screenplay, and through this whole process, you operate something in your mind called vision. You have to have a vision of the idea. You have to have a vision of how your script is going to look. You have to have a vision of how your screenplay is going to look. You know, I mean, sometimes you may not want to use the zoom at all. For example, in my first film called Stringar, which was a period film set in the 1920s, my cinematographer, Mr. Madhu Ambat, he did not want to use the zoom at all. He said, I'll use a trolley, I will, um, use all other forms of, um, you know, <coughs> ranging the camera, but I will not use this one. Because it gives a very different rhythm and a very different energy when you use that. And you wanted to keep the rhythm uh, steady throughout the film. So, I mean, you can even, you know, use little, little details like that to give your film a very, very different look. So, so that's the thing about, about content. Now, through through the last hundred years, you start, I mean, for example, we had Raja Harish Chandra, which was the first film made. That was about the content, because it was mythology about a man who only told the truth. That was the power of the narrative. Today, you have films like Life of Pi, yeah. you have Avatar. Yeah. What is it that strikes you about them? It was animated, but any form of animation does not grab your attention. It was animated around the concept, right? And that was even more revolutionary because it was performance capture. But what was the basic idea on which Avatar worked? The basic idea, to be quite honest with you, was capitalism versus environmentalism. Yeah. It was about how the capitalists exploit nature. So he created this entire alternative universe of nature and the tale the head, the body, the body language, the eye contact, the energy contact, so everything was envisioned around the emotional quotient of those who lived in consonance with their environment. That was the vision of the film. And then you had the crass capitalists, as the film depicted, who would come and exploit it, and how the clash of the two universes actually happened. So that is what determined how the performance capture would look. Now, if you look at Life of Pi, I'm sure all of you have seen yes. it, right? There was a, a kind of a joke, which may not have been a joke, that maybe the best actor award should have gone to the tiger. <laughs> because it was so, I mean, the performance was so brilliant, spectacular, because it was the character that he was animating. 
He did not say, I have a tiger now, so I'll make it fight, I'll make it dance, and then uh, I'll make it chase, and then the job is done, and I'll make it, you know, roll, and then the job is done. No. The tiger was a character in the film. It was part of the narrative. And it emoted. There was anger, there was anxiety, there was um, pain. tension. Pain. Sorry? Pain. There was pain. And there was, towards the end, there was equanimity. It walked away. It, walked away. it turned once and it walked away. What a, what a poignant uh, emotion to give a tiger. You know, who does that? I mean, most people who animate a lion or a tiger, you know how they do it. So, so again, it was content that determined it. He, he, he thought through, the director, what the mood of the tiger, what the graph of the tiger is, what, how the tiger traveled through the film, accordingly animated it, you know. So, so content wins at the end of the day. Now the other thing that, I'm just going to talk about three or four generic aspects of the field, okay? The other thing that um, determines how cinema grows and how it has grown over the last hundred years is the structure and the mechanisms that, uh, that enable cinema. So what the most traditional mechanism that enabled cinema was known as the studio culture. For example, you have Disney, you have Fox. Here you have you had RK Studios, Gemini, Alien, you know, in India. Now, the, the, what did the studios do? What was the studio culture? The studio culture was to be the producer and the distributor and the revenue collector, all in one, in the field. So they therefore spread their wings and entrenched themselves in a market as big as they wanted to. There was a time when Fox and Disney and those kinds of North American studios were strictly North American related. But today they've entered the Chinese market, they've entered the Indian market, Sony Pictures, etc. So they've gone global, basically. Today you have Yashraj, which is a kind of a studio. It has a studio culture, which has also entered the global market. Reliance did, big entertainment, etc. So that is one. Sorry? T-series. T-series. T-series is still very Indo-centric. It's not gone that <coughs> you know. But it's a very successful example. But T-series is somewhere <coughs> in the middle between corporatization and, and the studio culture. Alternative to that was another space called the independent cinema. You know, and I would say that my first film was made in that format of independent cinema because we didn't have any studio production house supporting us. They jumped in later after we won the awards to distribute the film. But the film was made of our own initiative by collecting our own producers and co-producers. So these are two of the things that actually determine how a film gets made and how it gets seen. Now, <coughs> what do you think has been the big shift in filmmaking in recent years? What do you think has been the big shift? Can anyone tell me? What has been the big shift, the big change in the film increase? Sorry? VFX graphics. Digital. Digitalization, essentially. So no more are people going to 35 mm yeah. and, and yeah. The film format is gone. The di digital format has come in. And uh, although it was meant to be uh, an improvisation of technology, it has actually changed the way people perceive and receive cinema. Because cinema has now become part of a larger conglomerate of media products. You know? I mean, today cinema filmmaking, strictly in those terms, can actually even be a hobby. Because you can use your phone, you can make a film, and you can put it up on YouTube. And you can get two million views in 24 hours if you're lucky. And then it goes viral, and then you could actually turn that hobby into a profession because people want you to then, uh, they want to back you to make more and more films like that. The other thing, and even the formats of the of, of filmmaking has changed. Yes. Earlier it was three, three and a half hours. It came down to two and a half hours. Now you have the short films that have come in. So feature films have also become two, two and a half hours. But having said that, 
I mean, even though digital digitization of, of media, not just cinema, has come to stay, and it's going to build on that, how media actually gets out, and how media is received and perceived, it's going to build on, on digital uh, technology. But having said that, have we then abandoned content? Have we given up content? Have we given up cinema as a way of, um, as an art form? Have we given up cinema as an aesthetic form? Do people still want to see um, high-end, uh, what some people call multiplex cinema? Although now multiplex is run commercial cinema, but multiplex cinema is a term which is used for certain aesthetics in cinema. My own take on it is that no, I don't think that is going away because there was radio. When cinema came, they said radio is going to die. But radio has made a huge comeback. People still want the radio. I mean, the FM stations yeah. are, in some ways, bigger advertising platforms than anything else right now. When, when television came, they said cinema is going away. But your first day, first show is still setting the pace for the currency of each film. In fact, today, if you look at satellite um, uh, spaces and satellite rights of cinema, today people are not buying films unless they do well in the theaters in India. Right? Now, when internet came, and when uh, YouTube and other forms of visual media came into play, you know, people said that theaters are going to go away and television is also going to go away. But that's also not happened. So my own reading is that the human being, whether it's you or you or you, you are a multiple person. Each of us is a multiple person. Sometimes, even in terms of the kind of films we want to see. When we say mass film and non-mass film, what are we talking about? We are not saying that this film uh, can be seen by a million people or 10 million people of which you are not a part. You are also a part of that 10 million people. But you are also a part of the audience for art cinema. So it is not because me or you, it's not because we don't want to see those films. But when we are in a certain mood, then we go to see a Salman Khan film. When we are in a different mood, we sit down in silence to see a Satyajitri or Kurosawa film. So we are multiple people with diverse identities and diverse aspirations and diverse artistic needs. So sometimes you may want to watch it on television. Sometimes you may say, I mean, a film called Bahubali came up recently in India. Now, on the one hand, it has been big, big bets, you know, animation films. And it has been critiqued against them as a film that did not develop content uh, adequately, that it was weak on content, so it used mythology as an excuse to do uh, a CG film, basically. So it used mythology, it didn't, it didn't, it was not inspired by the mythology. It used the mythology. So even if you look at the body language of the protagonist, the hero, hero, there's nothing mythological about it. It's very today's natural hero. Just like there was a critique of Lagan. Some people yes. said it's a period film. Other people said, no, it's today's film, but it's a costume drama. So again, the cultural dimension of how you look at a film also is very complex and it's changed. Yeah. So would you say Bahubali is, is, a, is, is a film of olden times? Would you say that? Not really, because the fights and everything was. Yeah. But he used the imagination of mythology to create that excitement. You know, big fields, 10,000 horses. Isn't that much more exciting than pressing a nuclear button? <laughs> it's more exciting. The other thing that's happened, which is a very curious thing, which is why I believe that content will always drive any form of audiovisual medium, is that in at a time when we are talking about smart cities, we are talking about urbanization, we are talking about digital India, guess what's making the real money? Rural films. Films based on rural India. I mean, a standing example of that is this Tamil film called Kaka How many of you have seen it? You've seen it. Excellent. Because this is a film that has taken two actors directly from Islam. And the entire film is shot in the back lanes 
of Chennai. How many of you have seen a film called Parutadiran, which came five to six years before? Exactly. So, yeah, you see. Yeah. So, so what we have seen is that content is important, and the nature of the content is important. At a time when everybody is living a middle-class life in the city, and people in the villages and towns are also aspiring to work towards that same city, urban, middle-class life. A rural vision, a rural image is very refreshing. Because a rural image is has got a certain spirit of life which you and I don't have. That's a fact. I mean, today, if I made a film on the middle class in general, it may not be as exciting as Kaka Mute, you know? And the other thing about the film Kaka Mute, what makes it revolutionary in terms of content, is that it is, the camera is from the POV of the poor, not top down, but bottom up, you know? So they, throughout the film, they are telling you how pained and how important is rupees 300 in their lives. You know, I mean, it keeps coming back. They had to collect the money, they had to go buy a pizza, and in the end, they didn't even like the pizza. So we assume that everybody is going to like, you know, Kentucky Fried Chicken and everything. That's not true. People also like the rupees and dosas, that's what. So it demystifies a lot of urban legends by bringing in these authentic rural factors. And that's the kind of content that's driving the youth today. And the other content that's driving youth today is irreverence. Complete, do you know what irreverence means? It means having no respect, you know, for, um, for a certain kind of tradition which has not helped them. You know, for example, we say listen to your elders. <coughs> Which elders are you listening to? What are they telling you? Are they telling you to be corrupt? I mean, if you look at what you've inherited as a system, you don't want to listen to it. You want to form your own systems, you know? So there's a lot of mockery, there's a lot of dark comedy, and there's a lot of insubordination towards a tradition or towards a convention, you know? And that is why the boy next door image has come to be. Dhanush would never have made it. Vijay Sethupati would never have made it in this, you know, the very dribbling looking young men. Because it was a culture of fair and lucky till they came along, you know. So I think that has changed because of the youth. You know, the conventional, somewhat unhealthy subordination has been rejected. And now there's a complete in your face irreverence today in cinema, which I personally think is a healthy trend. So so I think the, the, the um, ultimate question is, what is cinema, what is media, what is the visual medium? The visual medium is nothing but a mirror and a reflection of where our minds are. When I once um, attended a guest lecture in Los Angeles by, I think it was George Lucas, one of the things that he did say was, Jurassic Park is not, not a fantasy. It came out of human beings' mind. Star Wars is not a fantasy. Because the human imagination is not so infinite. The human imagination is affected by experiences and the visualization of those experiences. So just as much as you know, uh, people flew on birds in mythology, people are flying on dinosaurs or other kinds of birds in, in, in Avatar. And the other thing is that even though a film like Jurassic Park would never have gotten made without digital technology, it was still driven by the content. It was about these creatures that went extinct and came back into our lives, you know? And then how do we interact with them? It's very, very reminiscent of what is going on in Mumbai today. If you look at places like Pawai and others, tigers are there coexisting along with people. I mean, people have got hurt by it, but it sets us thinking about how are we coexisting with nature? How are we co So there is an idea, there is a message. The other example I wanted to give you was a film that didn't do well with the box office. It's a film called Akarshan. Yeah. I don't know how many of you have heard of it. It's a film that is a commentary on the education system of India. Right? Yeah. What is it called? Prakashja. Prakashja. 
Now the film, although it didn't do so well in the box office, it will be talked about, it is still talked about because of its content. Another film that I must mention here is a cult film called Satya, which came years and years ago, which introduced this actor called Manoj Vajpayee. Why was it a cult film? It was the first film that showed you that the irreverence that I talked about. Until that time, the bad guy was shown in a bad light, and he was the bad guy. But Satya actually glorified the bad guy in a way. I don't think it was meant to be an act of glorification. I think it was meant to be an act of insubordination, an act of irreverence. Saying that <coughs> bad guys also have a life, they also come from somewhere, they also have a story, backstory, and they have a sense of humor, and in some ways they are interesting. But I don't make them good guys. I'm just showing those sides of the bad guys. They also fall in love. They also want to you know, fight emotionally for their friends. So in a sense, you can say that the larger interpretation from or takeaway from a film like Satya is show the bad guy as he is. Don't be insecure to show him as he is. Don't immediately think that he becomes a good guy. You know, society is not that stupid. So you don't have to be so evangelistic about him that you have to show everything bad about him. Show him as he is. You know, society is capable of understanding what that is. So in a sense, it is also cinema coming of age in terms of content. That you don't have to pretend and exaggerate something, you know, uh, assuming that society is filled with idiots. Because people understand what the morality of that is. So um, I just wanted to stop here. And uh, how long have I spoken? <laughs> 40 minutes. Really? Yes. Yeah, I, I think we should just um, have an interactive session now. I made it very, very general. But you can ask me any questions that you want. You say that there are films based on contents. Yeah. So I've seen lately that if a film is if a film is having a very good story, they don't take huge actors like suppose the three Khans or the three yeah. or someone like that. So they they don't take any big stars. Instead, they go for uh, I mean the most basically who has become a big star or one of the star like uh, you know underrated actors or something. Why they don't take uh, huge yeah. actors? See, basically what happened was that cinema got divided into art cinema and commercial cinema. Even in commercial cinema, even if you take a really flippant film, like Happy New Year, for example, yeah. it still had an actor. It still had an emotional uh, uh, luck, you know, and an emotional switch. I mean, and then, you know, she wants she wants to open a dance school. He wants, he wants to go and take revenge on rob somebody. So there's still that emotional switch in the film. But what happened was that commercial films fell into a certain kind of formula. And that formula became star driven. Right? Now a lot of those stars are also beginning to act in, and now there is no real division between art and commercial cinema. That division is not there anymore. Because people want content again. They want to go and see. I mean if you look at the recent releases have you seen? Have yes. Seen, yeah? Released along with Jasbah. Jasbah has done drastically badly, yeah. which is actually right. Yeah. And Talwar has done brilliantly. Yeah. It's really late in the box office. Yeah. So that tells you something about the audience. But I just think that this divide between art and commercial cinema is now kind of bridging. But it's not bridged completely yet. Somewhere in the middle of all this, Shah Rukh Khan also did a film called Chakde India. Yeah. Swadesh. 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 Which was a flop and it's yeah. so good. But it's still talked about <coughs> as a film that's meant to be talked about. So I think that the way in which the system, the, the structure of production and distribution vetted on commercial cinema as a mass, lowest common denominator, line of least resistance kind of cinema. But now that gap is slowly being filled because the audience is getting restless. The audience is evolving all the time. <coughs> I mean, this is an audience, honestly, when I was in, um, in, in my 20s and 30s, I thought radio was dead. I thought it was dead. It was actually dead for about 10 to 15 years. Where did we have radio for 10 to 15 years? Look at the comeback that it's made. So the youth wants to listen to radio. 
And in the 90s, people only wanted to see music. They didn't want to hear music. But today they want to hear, they, when they go on a drive, they switch on their FM. And it's become a huge business area and a huge mode of communication. So I think audiences actually drive how cinema is made to a large extent. Now, much more than they ever did before. Earlier it was a production houses which conditioned you to believe what you should see and what you should miss. But today audiences are thinking to themselves. So that gap is being bridged now. It's not yet fully bridged, right? But it's happening. Because Nawazuddin, what's his name? Nawazuddin. Yeah, he is not a small actor anymore. <coughs> he's, a, he's, he's a big actor, but he's choosing to do his films because he's an actor. So, so I think that's happening. Saif Ali Khan, a lot of the big stars are wanting to do um, this kind of content-driven cinema. So I think that's happening. But I think it was this formula versus art, which was driven by the production houses that created the gap. I think the gap is closing. It may not, may not happen too fast, but it's happening. Anything else? I just want to um, <coughs> conclude what I started in the last five minutes. I just want to say that in order to be able to uh, streamline your uh, aspirations, whether you want to be a sound engineer, whether you want to be a filmmaker, whether you want to be um, a media journalist, it could be anything. I think training is important because today, if you look at the field, 90% of the top end technicians come out of FDI. Because at that time, there really was no other training school. So when you go through these two or three years, or four years or whatever, in an institution, you may not fully realize the power of what you're going through. Because it streamlines your thought process, and of course it smartens you up, technologically, and in terms of the craft of what you do. So, I do think that good cinema, and even top-end commercial cinema, has, has succeeded in, uh, certainly in, in almost all film industries. I would refer to the Indian film industry because you must be more familiar with that only because of the, that layer of technicians that came out of FDI. Now there are many more film institutes, such as AAT, which will produce that, uh, the next generation of uh, that layer, you know, which holds up not just cinema, but all forms of innovative media products. You know? I mean, today Netflix yeah. is uh, a huge platform yeah. for uh, all kinds of media products they're going to bring out. So that's going to be a huge market opportunity for the next two generations of uh, uh, craftsmen, that's what I call the technician, they're craftsmen, who are going to come out of these half a dozen film institutes and media training institutes in the country. Even today there are only half a dozen, there aren't too many of them anyway. So, so I think that's going to happen. So that's something that you must keep in mind when you're going through your course. Anything else? Feel free to ask anything you want. And we'll be here for the next half an hour. <coughs> this is, uh, I mean, uh, when Life of Pi released, this is an experience I would tell. I went to my mom and uh, my uncle and aunt. We saw the movie. What, uh, what I felt, the movie was really good, not just because how uh, how the animation was shown, how the crap, how they made the movie. It was about the story, you know. Like the content of the movie was quite fascinating to me, and I really loved it. Right. But when I, but when it comes to then, it's about how we truly believe in God. So I don't believe much, but then in this movie, it was actually really interesting. Right. But when it comes to like my my mom, my mom is like. There's nothing great about it because there's a boy, a tiger, and a boat, and it's all time it's about how they survive. So, what I felt is that is how actually a life would be if a boy is stuck in a boat with an animal. They usually have this kind of similar situation like how they have to survive. So today's present, uh, what I'm trying to say is in the present generation, people usually look more onto uh, something which interests them. You know. It's not about what is happening, what happens in the actual life. 
No, I think that is about how you receive a film. Yeah. Now, it is not necessary that your mother has to receive that experience only from Life of Pai. She may receive it from an actual God film. Yes. If she is a person of faith, those kind of films also get made. You know, I'm not saying in terms of believing in God. I'm saying in terms of understanding the meaning. She didn't she receive didn't, it the way you yeah, received it. Exactly. Which is all right. Which is not a problem. Because there are two ways in which you receive a film. Both ways need not make that film a bad film. In the sense, you receive it in terms of your experience of what is going on in the space in which these there's the ocean, the boat, the boy, and eventually the tiger after the first few animals disappear. So you're, you're traveling with him in that space. In her case, she's not traveling with him and his narrative. She might do that in some other kind of film, you know, which has more incidents. Maybe she prefers to see an event-oriented film, although this film had a lot of events. Yeah. But maybe she wanted a change of scene. Yeah. You know, for example, I have a neighbor who went to see a movie after many, many years, an old lady. And I said, how was the film? She said it was okay because, you know, during the climax, there was no thunder and lightning. <laughs> <laughs> so because that goes off in her head, the thunder, that's how it came. You know, it's an expression of what happens in your head. Yeah. So I was thinking to myself that she needs it because she's used to seeing the thunder and lightning when she saw a Sivaji Ganesh film or a, you know, the Lip Kumar film. And she, she likes that formula. But today things have changed. Today there's sometimes absolute silence where there's absolute rage between two people. Yeah. You know, and I don't. I, you, you may understand it, but your parents may not. So that's why you have a range of uh, genres yeah. in cinema. I mean, you have not just commercial and art. You have expressionist, impressionist, postmodern. Um, you know, art house, not art but art house. So you have a range where the whole notion concept of a genre happened only because of the variety of audiences <coughs> and each one wanted to see the same thing in a very different way. She may have liked this film if it had been a jungle with lots more people, with few guns. With lots of more uh, uh, scenes which will excite Exactly. People. And many more animals, yes. lots more color. She may have, you know, enjoyed it. That's okay. That's, that's not a problem. Anyone else? Actually, right now, there are quite a few women directors. I don't think I'm that special. Maybe I was when I came in, which was about eight, nine years ago, but now there are lots of women directors. But even then, there was Aparna Sen and, you know, a whole range of women directors. Mila Nara was already there before my talent. They're not in India, strictly, however. No, I think I didn't think of myself as a woman when I... I thought of myself as somebody who wanted to make movies. I would have probably felt the same way if I were a guy. But uh, well, I was working, I was engaged with the film industry. I was working uh, as a program officer in a funding organization, which as a program officer for culture and media, filmmakers. So the temptation <coughs> tends to grow. And But I also, I must say that I started making movies only when I felt that I had something which should be seen as a film. Tomorrow, if I have an idea that would look better as a book, I would write. So for me, film is an artistic medium. Film is not an end in itself. What happens in that film, to me, is the end. And the ultimate end is how it actually gets received. How you create that experience. You know? So, so I, I'm very clear about that. For me, cinema is all forms of media and technology. For me, it's a medium towards an end. And that end is a collective experience that you create in the community that uh, gets to see the, that particular media product. But other than that, there was nothing dramatic, to be honest. But if you want to know what the first trigger was, then uh, when I was uh, working professionally at that time, I was attending a lot of seminars on uh, women's rights and sexuality and you know, feminism and all of that. And at one point, when I was talking to a very, very old artist, when I started reading about 
artists like old artists like Devi Subalakshmi and Bala Saraswati, and I realized how much they were feminists in their own way. But nobody wanted to talk about that. You know, we love to take things which come from abroad. So I felt that the root of that feminism is this thing called the Devdasi. And Devdasi was a temple dancer uh, for all over India. You know, Odisha had its own Devdasi system. Andhra Pradesh had its own, etc. But I was really focused on the culture that I knew from the with, which is Tanjava, which is Tamil Nadu, which is one of the hubs of the Devdasi system. And I wanted to go back and explore that feminism, you know, which was not aggressive, which was not externally, which didn't pick up the sword and fight, but which was extremely strong and extremely powerful. And they had only one weapon, that was their art. That's the only thing that gave them strength, nothing else. So even today, if you look at artists, very kind, you know. I mean, look at Hussein. I mean, he got chased out of this country. Now, you may say that's right or wrong, but the next result is he went. And, uh, but he never gave up his, he never ever said sorry never apologized for his form of art. And uh, that's the strength, if you ask me. I mean, some may argue, why did he go away? But you know, beyond the point, you can't take on the system. But the system is attacking him, you know? The system is more powerful than the individual. But the fact is, as an artist, he never gave up his artistic integrity, in that sense. So, from the 8th century AD, and I felt that these women were essentially visual. I couldn't write a book, it wouldn't be the same. Because they are about music, they are about their dance, they are about their jewelry. Now, what better form than, you know? So, for me right now, my thought process is very visual. So I'm making movies. Tomorrow, if it's textual, then I will probably write a book. That's all. But other than that, I think most people who do what they do, not just um, filmmakers, but I think most people who do what they do, either they do it unwillingly, that they don't actually want to do what they're doing, or they are driven to doing it, you know. I think people who give these highly romantic stories beyond that are usually exaggerated. <laughs> but I think it's a creative uh, journey for me. And it's very important to keep on <coughs> taking from life, you know, whether it's politics, to understand what is going on, whether it's a walk on the beach and you, and you watch 20 people. You can sit in the airport, you can watch 50 people and make a film on that. If you see it in that creative way, it's about how you see it. It's not about what you see. So I think that is the essential driver of any good creative product, including films. That was a long answer for that. Anything else? I will be coming back on probably in January to take class for all. That will be a more typical thing. This was just a ice breaking interactive <coughs> session. And our last question. Sure. Uh, like, uh, and this for example, yeah. it's about you. Yeah. Sure. Uh, you have made, you have directed a lot of movies. No, okay. I haven't. Which no, I'm just giving as an okay. example. You have directed a lot of movies, and uh, some uh, like few movies have been a huge hit. Some movies people may have not liked it, so it wasn't rated as the hit part, somewhere in the middle. And so, and and there will be some movies which will be rated as like not good. So will this stop you from making uh, like again? Uh, no. The only thing that will stop me is lack of funding. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me, will anybody else be stopped by anything else? I don't think so. So um, no, not at all. Because when you, each time you make a movie, you are starting all over again. Yeah. Although you, somewhere your uh, system has absorbed the experience yeah. of the previous uh, films that you've made, but you're starting again because it's a different narrative, it's a different story, different cast of characters, a different setting, everything changes in that, you know. I mean, my first film and my second film, there is no connection. You will not see any connection. A much better example of that is Shekhar Kapoor. I mean, look at the range of this man. I can't think of another filmmaker. Maybe <coughs> except Speedy Bird. He made Bandit Queen. He made Mahasoom. He made Mr. India. Yeah. He made Elizabeth. Yeah. It's insane, his range, you know? It's like he lives in five different planets yeah. and lives there perfectly. It's like that. 
But um, so I think that's pretty much how I think, in a sense. So I, I, I think when you make a movie, you have an idea, you have a vision, you know how you want to do it, you're inspired. The rest has to fall into place. But I don't think that stops anyone. It doesn't stop anyone. Anything else? No questions? My speech was that perfect? <laughs> Have you switched it? Mm -hmm. It's working. It's still working. Okay, hello. Still in his name. So, um, so I, then I'll just review this, and I just want to say that um, I will be back. Uh, I'm in the middle of starting my next film, so somewhere in the middle of that, I'll find time to come back and interact with all of you some more. Sure. And uh, enjoy your course. I enjoyed it when I did it at AAT. It's very useful and it's very rigorous and it's very relevant. That's very important. And uh, think about the big picture that you live in, even as you're doing your course. Try and relate it to, you, to your larger environment always. Okay? And focus on content and craft, the two C's that will take you forward. And your life is made. Okay? Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I thought you were going to switch it after the first 40 minutes. Mm -hmm. I'm